Good evening. This evening I would like to explore <clears throat> the um, a subject called psychotropic drugs, which are those drugs which, when ingested, produce complex states of mind, states of mind leading to more profound states of realization. And to do that, I thought I would go through a book and introduce the idea of magic mushrooms and LSD through Wasson. <clears throat> um, just a couple of curiosities. We appear, when I say we, the um, intellectual world, which is very slow, very ponderous, and slow to come to insights, started exploring the Eleusis mysteries, going backwards instead of forwards. That is to say, when um, Hoffman discovered LSD 25 in 1943, <clears throat> and the impact of that discovery uh, caused Wasson to become interested in uh, Aldous Huxley, uh, Aldous Huxley. Uh, and so he journeyed to um, Central America in the hunt for magic mushrooms. And uh, thank goodness he discovered some. And that was in 1952 he published his great work. Then Wasson met Hoffman. They were got to be friends as a result of their similar interests. And in uh, July of 1975, Wasson asked Hoffman, the chemist who discovered LSD-25, he said, I'd like to know your opinion whether or not the Greeks could have been using some kind of psychotropic drug in the Eleusinian mysteries. Well, um, Hoffman took that and he said, well, you know, that's a very interesting question. And so he began exploring the subject through the back door. That is to say, he began exploring to what degree you can say they were psychotropic drugs available in the Greek world, and whether or not if we could identify them, whether it would be possible to get a description of them especially their effects, and then go back into literature and see whether there's some match between the literature in the ancient days and the current literature and the current reports of people who are ingesting these uh, substances in today's world, which is a rather backwards way of studying things. But that's the way we do things, and better that than nothing, right? So better that than nothing. <clears throat> so Hoffman then did the study and it's reported in this book. And it's a very beautiful book, and I want to recommend it to anyone have an interest in the subject. It's a very beautiful book, and it's by these three authors, Wasson, Ruck, and Hoffman. And I'd like to read a couple of sections of it because I'm going to use it in order to explore an idea that I've had for a while. Not particularly new, I might add, but um, I think nonetheless interesting. Now, Hoffman then went and said, well, look here, it appears that it's quite obvious that there is a certain relationship between ergot, ergot on wheat, not on rye, on wheat, because ergot is a, uh, what they call a, <clears throat> it's actually a parasite on wheat, and it has its origin from spores that fly in the air, of course, and they land on the wheat and they take root. It's a fungal, you see, it's a fungal, which is to say it, it has its origin among the mushroom world. 
So ergot of wheat is really a fungus. Uh, it's a body of fruit, fructifying uh, fruit of a mushroom. So let us take a look. Um, not only, by the way, does it come on uh, wheat, but also barley, which is a very important substance for it. So it's called ergot of bar barley. And therefore, and I'd like to go each one of them, lolium and especially paspalum, which is the most important one for this evening's talk. Now, in order to explore this idea, what, what I think it's a very nice way of introducing it, um, Wasson says, let us first raise the question of whether or not the Greeks were into herbs, were they herbal people, were they herbal people. And he has a very, very interesting way of approaching it. He goes back to Homer, and I have a couple of quotes from Homer that I'll read to you. Essentially what he says is that wine drinking in those days, in the classic period, is not something that was done the way we do it today, which is basically we drink wine, and it's got a cork, and the cork keeps it um, uh, in the best of its condition. He said in those days they didn't have corks. They had to use different substances which had a camphor, primarily camphor, and then had a terrible taste, and therefore the first thing you had to do when you open up a keg of wine in those days is handle that problem of camphor in your wine. Ah, herbs. So therefore, they explored, they didn't drink wine straight. When they did drink wine, they diluted it usually one to three, uh, three parts water, one part wine. Because their wine, they kept saying, was so intoxicating, and, it, and if it drank purely, they thought it would bring about madness. So the Greeks, therefore, developed this idea of each household would bring together a variety of herbs to add to their wines. And I have a section from Homer, which is a great quote, I think, from Helen and the Odyssey and... Uh, Let me just read it to you. The hero Menelaus, companion in arms, Asphalion, poured water for their hands, and once again they touched the food before them. But now it entered Helen's mind to drop into the wine that they were drinking an anodyne, mild magic of forgetfulness. Whoever drank this mixture in the wine bowl would be incapable of tears that day. Though he should lose mother, father, or both, or see with his own eyes his son or brother mauled by weapons of bronze at his own gate, the opiate of Zeus's daughter bore this canny power. It had been supplied to her by Polydamon mistress of Lord Thun in Egypt, where the rich plantations grow herbs of all kinds, helpful, maleficent, and no one knows medicine as they do. Egyptian heirs of Pan, the healing god, she drugged the wine then and had it served and said, taking again her part in the conversation, O oh, Menelaus, Atreus' royal son, and you, that our great heroes, sons, you know how Zeus gives us all in turn, good luck and bad luck being all powerful. So take this refreshment, take your ease in hall, and cheer the time with stories. So she set them up with a great drink of opiates and different herbs and mixed them in the wine, and that was the Greek tradition, see? So uh, by this quote that Wasson uses, then he uses many others to show that in those days, Every household had their own way of mixing particular herbs together to make a particular kind of wine, which had a wide variety of effects. Now, en enough for that. Okay, enough for that. Um, I'd like to proceed, going back and forth, make a couple of points in order to get to the point I'd like to explore. Uh, Oleum, which is really tares or wild rye, as we call it today. And then there's ergot, each of these are an ergot. Olive palspium, 
Now this is a very interesting ergot of Palsium. This is really a grass, very common throughout the entire Mediterranean region. And it contains ergine and ergonavine and uh, an LSD ammonide. So what's so significant about this particular one, this grass? It grows wild throughout the Mediterranean. And it is subject to this ergot, which is a fungal, carried by the wind, and therefore it's a parasite on the plant. And during the seeding, these uh, ergot, that's very much similar to the seed, except it has a peculiar turn to it. Actually, it, it has a very peculiar turn. It, it has a kind of interesting shape. And therefore, they sometimes call it the, uh, uh, the rooster's tail. Right, because it has that aspect to it. So, in any case, when it drops to the ground, right, something interesting takes place because that causes, therefore, the, the germination of the Calvisipes purpurea, which is a fancy word for our How's palum? Wild grass in the Mediterranean. Particular kind of grass. Carries on this particular kind of ergot. And when you remove the uh, uh, scalaritina, which is really nothing other than this, the, the seed, drops to the ground and fertilizes. Now, it has this appearance. It has this appearance when it grows many mushrooms on one particular base. And these mushrooms then begin to be the basis of much of the Greek art when they're drawing and they're sketching mushrooms. They often use this particular mushroom as the mushroom to capture, to show in their pictures. Now, Wasson asked Hoffman, I would like to know whether the technology of the Greeks could possibly have been of such a kind and quality that when you did get these psychotropic drugs in native plants or herbs, how they could have extracted it. Because it's a, like LSD-25 is extremely expensive extraction process to get it finally in, in the uh, soluble form. He says, but this is not. This is soluble in water. It's direct, it's straight, it's pure. It can be as strong as you want the solution. And when it dries, it can be used in powdered form. Now, when you talk about this kind of property, it has a long life. That is to say, like it has a long shelf life. It's potent for a long period of time, the powdered form. Therefore, uh, Hoffman said that uh, since this grows right around Ilias, the great mystery center of the Greeks. Uh, he said, you know, this is most likely, it's likely to be a combination of two things. The ergot of the wheat, he said, that's quite in evidence, quite in evidence. He said, but it's most interesting that it probably was the palsum, right? The pals palum, the grass, the two together could have produced the kind of mixture because uh, it's soluble in water, easily available. The fields right next to the Ellicinian Mysteries was a sacred wheat field that was sacred to the Mysteries. And uh, as you probably know, the Ellicinian Mysteries had a 2,000 year reign. And uh, they were finally closed down by the Christians, of course, in the fourth century. And uh, that ended it. But in uh, terms of archaeology, the site at Ilias, you can find that the archaeological changes of these old buildings go back to 2,000 years. And therefore, according to Hoffman, the fields were, such, uh, were involved in such cultivation over such a long period of time, it's inevitable that they would have reached the same conclusions he reached, which is that it's quite easy to see that 
when you're working with ergots, you finally get an insight in the basic substance. You begin to understand how they're put together. There's nothing, you don't need a test tube for it. You don't need any scientific apparatus. Uh, you might need a few subjects. But evidently, when you're talking about psychotropic drugs, there are often several people who'd be willing to try them for some curious reason. Now, um, I'd, I'd like to read a couple of things about this now, just for a moment. <clears throat> um, uh, sclerotonium, by the way, sclerotonium is the, is, is the uh, seeds that drop. And it's these, the reason they call it that is because anything that has a long lasting life that still has a uh, potent power to it is given that generic name. So, of course, it's a nitri nitrogen containing alkaline substances, as you undoubtedly know. In any case, I'd like to uh, just read you a couple of paragraphs that I think are very significant in this. Um, there's a chapter called Solving the Ellicinian Mysteries. Um, This is the kind of book that, you know, when you, you glance at it, you, you can uh, spend some time reading nearly any paragraph. <clears throat> I'm in uh, chapter four. The ancient testimony about Eleusis is unanimous and unambiguous. Eleusis was the supreme experience in an initiate's life. It was both physical and mystical trembling, vertigo, cold sweat, and then a sight that made all previous seeing seem like blindness, a sense of awe and wonder at the brilliance that caused a profound silence since what had just been seen and felt could never be communicated. Words are unequal to the task. Those symptoms are unmistakable. It's the experience induced by hallucinogens to reach that conclusion, we only have to show that rational Greeks, and indeed some of the most famous men and the intelligence men amongst them, could experience and finally enter into such irrationality. Eleusis was different. It wasn't a symposium of people coming together as friends or festivals in a drama. At Ulysses alone, the experience occurred with overwhelming finality. Here alone was the grand design fulfilled of the maiden resurrected with her son conceived in death and of the ear of barley that like her had sprouted beneath the earth. But his resurrection was validated. The continuance of all that a Greek held most dear, the civilized way of life that beyond the, each city's constitution was the Greek heritage evolved out of aboriginal primitivism, just as all life, too, came from the beneficent accord with the Lord of death. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I'd like to just review what kinds of things uh, people had to go through in preparation for entering into the mysteries and ingesting uh, the substance that they brewed. <clears throat> right? So, let me just jump to it. From what we can uh, gather from the literature, people studied for approximately six months the rituals, the meaning, the myth, the myth of uh, uh, Demeter and, and uh, Persephone. They fasted before they entered into this ritual. They bathed, they abstained from all kinds of taboo foods. They offered a sacrifice. The sacrifice often was a pig. They had a long walk from Athens all the way down to Eleusis, which is several miles. They held night-long dances, night-long, with music accompanying it. 
in the ritual itself, there was a reenactment of the sacred drama at Ulysses. They had to play a role in it. Each of the participants had to play a role in it. They were then informed of the particular meaning of each of the myths and the rituals that they were engaged in. They participated in the potion, the drink, the ritual drink, and it opened up, um, according to the evidence that they have, mystical visions, hallucinogenic experiences of a very profound nature. Now, they had months of learning and rituals preceded the revelation on the mystery night each action programming in further detail the meaning and substance the full ramifications of that vision lay ahead the initiates would sit on the steps in the initiation hall they had learned the secret version of the sacred myths they bathed in the sea they abstained from taboo foods and drinks Sacrificed a pig, taken the long walk along the sacred way from Athens. And um, in the initiation hall, there was a final ceremonial dance of the priestesses, carrying the chalice of grain upon their heads as they mixed and distributed the sacred potion. And herbs associated with the illicit nature of the abduction immersed in water in which was added a sprinkling of flour from the barley grown in the plain above Ulysses. Of these two plants, which we just mentioned, the initiates drank and then paused expectant for redemption while the Hierophant chanted the ancient words. Then suddenly there was a light and the boundaries on the, this world burst their bounds as spiritual presences were felt in their midst. The hall was flooded with glowing mystery. It's a reenactment of the sacred drama. The fish ants had their roles to play. Till at last they experienced as actor, actors the ineffable. As the initiates passed through lengthy proceedings, they were admitted to many secrets. The sacred water of the potion had already soaked up in the right dosage from the immersed ergot what it contained of ergine and ergenovine, as we call them today. But the Herophants were certainly, through the centuries, seeking ways to improve their techniques, their formula. In the course of two millennium, may they not have discovered a kind of ergot that contains solely the hallucinogenic alkaloid, such as has been found in modern times, an ergot, a paspalum, throughout the Mediterranean. Known to all the herbalists. Now, um, I could talk a bit about the Eleusinian mysteries, but I don't want to do that. I have another idea I'd like to advance for you. Now, today, psychopharmacology is well known. Our chemists have produced a wide variety of psychotropic drugs. I'd like to suggest why don't we as a people do what the Eleusinian mysteries did for the Greeks? They made them into one people. They shared very profound experiences together. It brought together all of the arts, dance, music, statuary. It brought together some of the greatest thinkers of the age and maintained a continuity of their culture for 2,000 years. It provided a camaraderie for people who participated in these rituals. Why don't we have our own Ulysses? Why don't we have one our own? Let's build around it the best of us. Make it unique. 
Look what we can do with a rat. Look what we've done with a rat in our culture. I mean, our culture, I think, is the only culture in the history of the world that has ever dignified a rat and made a castle for it, right? Mickey Mouse, right? <laughs> right look what we've done. We're crazy. We're absolutely crazy. We've, we've turned something sacred into entertainment. You know what entertainment is? A waste of time. Why don't we put all of that combined talent? Look at Las Vegas. They can recreate Rome. Why don't we recreate the Aslinian Mysteries? Why don't we put together the same thing? Why don't we put our people through six months of the most profound learning or more? Let's turn our institutions, our intellectual institutions, in the preparation for participating in a ritual. Let's create the ritual. Let's bring together the best of our, our, our thinkers and give that explanation, that mythos that's necessary to make something significant. Now look here, we can do the same thing. We can take over Catalina. <laughs> hey, we can take over Catalina. We can build a great temple up there. We can make it sacred. We can bring about the best psychopharmacological products. Look here, we can, transform, we can transform this stupid problem of drugs in our culture that puts into jail a large population of our people. Some of our most creative young people end up in jail, as you all know. Let's legalize it and spiritualize it. Here's the problem, you see, here's the problem. The problem is in our culture, we produce superficial relationships, superficial interactions, social interactions, which we all know. They drain us. They're frustrating. There's a futility in everything and an emptiness everywhere. So what do we do? Our solution is intensify whatever we do by that sacred religion that's the only one we have, which is F-U-N. Right? Have fun. Be entertained. Right? You sit there, let someone else go through something, and you smile, laugh, cheer, weep, and cry, right? Why don't we just transform this? Let's say, look here, this is the problem. People get involved in human relationships, sexual relationships, casual relationships, it's all casual. Why don't we do what the Greeks did? Why don't we just turn it around? Let's turn it around. Let's get together and turn this cookie around so that then we can get the best architecture, the best music, the best graphics. Let's bring in together all the kind of the electronic means that we have at our disposal. Let's create a world's fair for the highest purpose, a spiritual purpose. Now look here, see what's wrong? This is what's wrong, you see? The reason this is the way it is is only for one reason, words. Words are the problem. You can't indulge in any of the superficial relationships without agreeing not to put into words where you are, what you see, how you feel. What, we're, what I'm suggesting at this point is, look here, people can take LSD 25 or these other substances at a party. They can turn it into entertainment. It could be just as just as entertaining as superficial as it was for the Greeks. Why do I say that? He's got a great quote of a great scandal that took place at 4.15. At 4.15, um, there was a, a scandal in Athens. The rich got onto the idea of what kind of substance was being used at the Eleusinian Mysteries. What do they do? Just what the rich do today. You take something sacred and you make it profane. You take something noble and you make it into a game. You rob it of its dignity and its spirituality and you call it fun. So let me just read you one great line here. 
Indeed, the herbalists, other than the heriophantic families, may have shared in this discovery, the discovery of the paspalum, which is the everyday grass that has this particular um, ergot. Indeed, herbalists, other than the heriophantic families, you see, just to go back, there are two primary families in Greece that maintained the continuity of the substance and made sure that whatever was being cooked and prepared as a substance maintained its quality over the 2,000 years. There was two, two primary families, and they're called the heriophatic families. Indeed, herbalists other than the heriophatic families may have shared in this discovery and may have been their knowledge that prompted the rash of profanations in, 14, uh, in 415 B.C. The inside story of those events will never be known. But that there was a story to tell is certain. They took this substance and they brought it into parties in Athens. So it can, the highest can be reduced to absurdity. What's the difference? You see, what do words do? Let me suggest something, all right? In any relationship you have, and you can take it from uh, one kind of physical event to another, it doesn't make any difference, as long as you're talking about a relationship with someone of the same sex and someone of, a, of the other sex, all right? What happens when you decide to enter into that relationship and you are going to reveal, share, most, the most meaningful level of your own existence? And especially why you're there. What does that do to it? What's the difference between relationships where the two, even if they're lovers, right? Beloveds, right? What's the difference between this couple and this couple who do exactly the same thing and relate exactly in the same way, and this is the only difference? Words. That they're willing to say what they think, willing to share their not necessarily secrets, but they're, they're what's most important to them, and especially about the other person. What does that do to the relationship? What would you say? Intensifies it. Intensifies it. Uplifts it, doesn't it? It brings about a new kind of relating. You see, all of these drugs offer you a way of relating. Therefore, if you don't have the words, if you don't have the learnings that go with it, if you don't have, then it becomes superficial. We have to go back and recreate the kind of mythos, if you like, learning, if you like. We have to visit and take part in all of the existing systems of worship. All the yogas, all the meditation devices, all of the sacred dances from peyote all the way down to the Mexican mushrooms. We want to re-examine them all and bring it together so that our people then can try to discover something. That is to give it the words, that's what's needed, a logos. See, that's what words are. It's a logos. Life without a logos is absurd. We need to give our people a logos, a way of participating on the most meaningful level. So we're going to take these drugs that are outlawed, and we're going to see if there is a way in which we can spiritualize it. Waken our people into the significance of meaningful relationships, because drugs are a doorway. It's a doorway. It doesn't bring you into the divine. It's a doorway, and depending upon how you go through that doorway, so you have the experience. If you go through that doorway in fear, right, if you go through that doorway in fear, you're going to have a certain kind of experience. How can we ennoble man? How can we make man approach the divine on the highest level? That's what we want him to share. We want him to prepare for that. So therefore, when he participates in these highest kinds of drugs, transformative drugs, it's no longer the modern religion of fun. 
but something meaningful that's sacred that'll bring us in touch with the divine. That's what we need. And that's what I wanted to share with you tonight. So let me just throw it open to all of you and I'll be willing to take questions any way you'd like to take them. You're talking about religion <coughs> and a search for truth as the Greeks did, but the Greeks uh, supported that with a slave uh, economy. <coughs> Most of the building of the temples were done by the slaves. No doubt. This is not an evening where I want to whitewash the soul of the Greeks. <laughs> you know, what I want to do is I want to say, look, they had something going for themselves. Let's only take the best that they had. Let's take it with our view of law and justice and make it greater than they had. Absolutely right. That's right. This is not a, I'm, I'm not trying to. Well, the Greeks allowed the irrational to be part of their life in this uh, religious way. We don't do that. We're scared of it. We, in, in, in uh, 1968, we outlawed all this stuff, even though there was no danger, uh, any, any dangerous experiences uh, that people had with the same mushroom, the sacred mushroom. Uh, they didn't have any dangerous experiences, just throwing mm -hmm. the cattle, because we're afraid of these irrational uh, spiritual states. We just don't want that. Well, so, it can have uh, serious uh, side effects to people who have trouble with serotonin, uh, whether it's a blockage or uptake. And uh, if people who would abuse it would be seriously uh, Absolutely damaged. right. Because Absolutely right. Well, That's why wouldn't it be interesting to have a full body of people so we could screen people and prepare them with all of the apparatus that we have. How do that with the generation raised on TV who are used to instantaneous gratification? People of our era, they, they said in their lifetime, they get close to 10,000 images processed through their minds. No Today, doubt. No it'd doubt. Be, uh, a child of 10 already has that. Yes, no doubt. But they don't have anything meaningful. Yeah. There's nothing more significant than competition between the, the superficial and the meaningful. <coughs> and this isn't for everyone. It isn't for everyone. Only those people willing to go through whatever screening is necessary, and let's hope in another 500 years it would be open to everyone. Let's introduce it into our culture and build all the safeguards into it that we can. Well, even then it was not everyone. <coughs> yes, it was. Yeah, yes and no. It was open to anyone who knew the Greek language and who had not uh, murdered anyone, had not in any way uh, found ways of justifying or finding it uh, expelled. They had to be free no, no, they no, no, that's not so. They had to be able to speak Greek. They only had to speak Greek. There are many stories of all kinds of people who were allowed into it. Uh, there's a very famous story of a young man who fell in love with a prostitute, and every time he sent her gifts, the madam took them over. So he said, I know what to do. I'll prepare to take her to the Eleusinian Mysteries. And so he went from Crete to the Eleusinian Mysteries, and of course the madam went with her. And uh, so uh, a wide non-slaves, slaves, Greeks. I a statement. Uh, you see, what, if, if you're going to fool around with, uh, with anything like this, and that's powerful, uh, you have to have a ritual. You have to have a, uh, have to have a ritual. hopefully, a society with rituals. Because if you haven't got rituals to do this, mm -hmm. you haven't got a spiritual Attitude, it, it's going to be made profane and it'll possess you. Uh, when you enter the other side through drugs, and you enter an alien state for us oh. because we're so educated and civilized, and we don't want to burn instinctions. Oh. That's if, right. If you don't know how to handle it, it's going to take over your mind and your emotions. That's right. And you're going to become. Uh, <laughs> it, That's it's, right. It's, it's rough. We need it has a to new. Be ritualized. Totally agree. We need a new class of people who can be guides to this kind of an experience, who can screen, who can bring people in it. Uh, there was a great book, you know, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the one that uh, Leary wrote. He stressed the fact that in taking LSD, one should prepare for the set, make sure that whatever set you have in the setting is appropriate to it. I'm going to, I'm saying that's true. Yeah, Every safeguard should be there. Timothy got derailed. 
Well, Timothy Leary went on and he left that splendid idea and he entered the universal new religion of fun. Okay. So That's the problem. That's the problem. Yeah. Also one of the dangers of missing with your serotonin. Uh, pardon me? Also one of the dangers of missing with your serotonin. When does it, you become the uh, slave instead of the master? That's why you need people there who can yeah. help you along the way. You, you, uh, you, you're in full of your, your, your own position. That's right. That's right. It would require a whole new profession, wouldn't it? And That's right. right. Of course, That's right. LSD is, That's right. A, is a world different from mushrooms and uh, rats. Totally agree. It's, it's the difference between a cherry bomb and an H bomb. That's and right. That's right. And Larry was one of us as if it was peyote. And it's That's not. right. It doesn't leave your system. That's right. Remember the That's right. It changes, and the serotonin levels are changed. Yeah. Remember the third guru in the, in the Harvard uh, school that was Timothy Leary, uh, Ram Das, who was called Richard Alpert. Richard Alpert. And the third guy. Uh, and, yeah. Mitch. Alpert. Yeah, that's right. Ralph Metzner. Metzner. Uh, Ralph, Ralph Metzner. I saw him yeah. at, a, at the Stanford uh, psychedelic conference back in 1992, and he was saying that, uh, and I, I loved him for saying it. He said, any time that I that I hear about an artificial drug like ecstasy, mm -hmm. which is artificial and made by man, mm -hmm. he says, I immediately think about what is the natural plant for it. That's right. Because that's he right. knows that the natural plant is the only way to go. No, no. Yeah. See, that's why LSD is, is dangerous, no. because it, it's, it's made in the laboratory, isn't it? To a certain yes. extent? Yes, yes. We'll it was. It's, synth it's a synthetic. Yeah. 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 See, that's yeah. what it's synthetic. Yeah. Man doesn't know it's, how to make It's a form of serotonin. That's right. Yeah. yeah. But nature knows how to do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. How often did they go to the... Uh, Most people only went once in their lifetime. Is that good? Large number. <laughs> <laughs> once is enough. <laughs> they said, wow. <laughs> That's a long-lasting wow. Or I've inspiring, been, wow. I've been grappling with this idea of uh, natural hallucinogenics versus the no, sure. laboratory itself. And, uh, no. I've, I've come across this uh, drug called DMT. I don't no. know if you're familiar with that. No. No. Now, that's apparently supposed to have the most profound effect uh, uh, from the writings that I've uh, read and uh, a lot of the reports are online. And interestingly enough, it's uh, apparently something that's like we're, we're carrying. Yeah. It produces, it's produced in our brain. Yeah. Yeah. So wouldn't that suggest then that the, the, yes. the divine, as you, as you were discussing earlier, has yeah. to be an organic um, addition to our planet as opposed yeah. to something that yeah. um, yeah. is uh, created by us? It, just to go uh, right with you, uh, if, if there is a particular um, a substance, whether it's synthesized or whether it's natural, that produces some kind of a mystical or profound state. And then we take a look at uh, the brain secretions, right? and we look at serotonin, serotonin, and we see the relationship between that and what is being ingested, like LSD-25. We see that it's quite similar in chemical composition. Therefore, you know, the other side of this study should be what kinds of practices, what kinds of life can man discover that can make it independent of that substance and produce within ourselves <coughs> those kinds of changes which can bring about that substance within ourselves, by ourselves. Yeah, that's the other side of those. Yeah, that's right. It, it, it seems to me like the, there's a... There's this biochemical process is necessary before uh, for you to be able to enter this door as, as you would uh, place it. My, mm -hmm. my uh, question, I suppose, would be, it, doesn't it seem to make sense then that perhaps this material that does have this biochemical process with us was sporified across our planet? I guess what I'm getting at is the Crick-Watson contention of panspermia, the notion mm -hmm. that uh, perhaps evolution and creation are the same thing. It could, it could lead to say that perhaps this particular process that our planet goes through mm -hmm. has something to do with the, the ancient secrets of the, the origins of the universe, yeah. perhaps? Yeah. 
Because yeah. now we're talking about something very sacred, and, and I wonder, mm -hmm. I wonder why more attention isn't given to it. And, and yet I look at the, I look at the, our current society, and we have this rave thing that's going on, where a lot of uh, kids between the ages of 16 and 25 are, are in fact getting together and having these uh, Elysian esque festivals. Uh, instead of using the uh, the air god, as you mentioned, they, they use MDMA. And no. It no. seems to have a very soul purifying experience for them. You know, it takes no. them out of the rough and tumble. No. Of the, the only it, see, no. what if it turned out that in order to have more profound experiences, you have to become more profound yourself? What if we could open up the most uh, meaningful works in philosophy and literature? and make that one of the ne necessary prerequisites for any of us. And by that very process, you're, you're working backwards and forwards between experience and an intellectual life. You're raising, see, one of the assumptions that we have in our culture, which I hear again and again, is that experience alone is significant. No, it's not, experience, I don't think so. It has, to have a, it has to have the background, it has to have the ritual, it has to have the mythos, it has to have a world of meaning, it has to have people who've gone there before you. You need guides in this world. Let's bring them all together. When you enter the other side without ritual, without guides of some kind, it is too scary, too alien for us. We don't know how to handle it. Uh, we're not going to be able to do it. Uh, the younger aren't going to be able to do it. Look what happened to them uh, in the 60s. Uh, they no. were possessed by the... No, by the, uh, I know it well. Uh, you know, but the state's in Congress. <laughs> Love, it's all very good. Sure. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, yeah. That's one of my friends came by one day. I was living in, uh, in San Francisco on uh, Twin Peaks. And uh, he was on a motorbike. And came up. I said, what are you doing? He said, I just dropped some acid. I'm going to race up to Twin Peaks. I said, there it goes. Drop acid, get on your motorbike, run up to Twin Peaks. Right. Fun. Fun. That's our problem. That's our problem. I think one of the problems is that, as he said, going through the door, and you think of it as two-dimensional space, when really the experience of the divine is an infinite number of dimensions. You can go mm -hmm. anywhere once you cross that pathway. Mm -hmm. That gateway. It's not opening the door and stepping into another room. You're yeah. opening the doors of right. perception, which is more than just three dimensions. That is what scares a lot of people when they go mm -hmm. through it, the loss mm -hmm. of their ability to perceive perception. Suppose we did this. Suppose we had <coughs> um, Plato's allegory of the cave. Manufacture. We build one. <laughs> Suppose we had Plato's Phaedrus, the journey of the soul into the upper world through all the mystical states leading to the highest. What if we had the dialogue that went along with it that gave it meaning? Suppose we built around it the ten ox herding pictures of the Buddhists. Suppose we brought some of the best Christian mystical literature Let's bring the best of all of that together. Let's bring it all. Let's find people who've gone through it and lived it and bring them together as our advisors. Let's get native shamans and bring them together. Let's get the yogis who had entered into profound states of mind and say, come on, we want to play to bring everybody into this. And if we can use this, if we can possibly use this as a vehicle as a catalyst, a cultural catalyst, let's see if we can change our culture. Uh, Instead of building more jails, yeah, drop the acid. The problem with that is that, is that it, it, it helps to have the right kind of sacred plants. That's and, right. And the sacred plants that are mm -hmm. available, like the sacred mushroom, That's it's right. illegal. That's right. And therefore, it puts a crimp into it. That raises a pretty interesting point with me, is, is that I, the question is, why is it? I mean, I, I have a... a well, I already really told you they threw it into the pot in, in 1968. They just threw it in. No, I think oh, he's asking why. Yeah, well, it oh. seems to me like uh, my personal experiences with that, 
you know, gems and pleasures and things of this nature have been a liberating experience, to say the least. And I wonder if, uh, if there's almost an economic motive behind the government illegally. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure there are many possible explanations for it. I'm more interested in turning it around rather than trying to understand why they did it. I'd rather talk about how can we can turn it around? Is it possible we can turn this around? What would it take? Rather than trying to figure out why we were so crazy back then. Because the same people that did that are still around. You'll be able to see them in a short while. What are some good actual ways to help turn it around? For instance, Terrence McKenna thinks he needs to hang out in Hawaii, sort yeah. of keeping it low key. And his gardens. Right, because it is. Mm -hmm. The government, it is so oppressive, and you can, mm -hmm. you know, obviously go to jail for a long period of time for well, potentially having some of these substances. So what's the best way to get it going, except? Buy, buy off a country. <laughs> move, it, move it to Holland. I mean, transportation is such that... Uh, I mean, I suggest... Find, find the Bahamas, I understand, are open for bids. In reference to somebody else's comment about the yeah, ritual, I, mean, I think I think having keeping it very sacred is important. Yes. Yeah, like you were suggesting yeah. that it can easily slip into the profane. Yeah. But I don't think that you want to have it. Uh, I don't. You wouldn't want to turn it into an orthodoxy. You wouldn't want it to be so regimented that all right, you have to go through X, Y, Z steps. You have to take it at five o'clock at this certain peak with these particular people. And, I mean, I'm not sure if you'd want it to get so formalized. No, no units. Couldn't. No units. No units. So it could all be through um, um, email. It could all be through <laughs> websites. People could learn through that. We could free ourselves of these institutional monstrosities. You know, they're all museums, intellectual. You know, university is an intellectual museum. <laughs> yeah, I mean, formally and the way it's built, everything. This would be a lie. We would have to, you know, uh, we'd have to have enough people like yourself in it to say, look, let's keep the spirit of freedom alive. Otherwise, it will die. Yeah, that's right. I totally agree with you. You know, I suggest that it's already happening in our in our culture. Uh, I think there uh, there are a few people around in the, especially in California, maybe in other states, that are already using sacred plants because I think the entrance is through sacred plants into the doorway. Uh, and they haven't come out public yet. They're still in the closet. Uh, when enough people mm -hmm. get enough experiences, uh, it'll, it'll take uh, a great number of years. You can't do this stuff in, in a few years. It'll take seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve years of, uh, of use by people on their own, secretly. And when the time is right, I think that they'll start coming out almost uh, uh, simultaneously to use uh, Rupert Sheldrake's uh, Concept oh. of uh, fields. Wouldn't it be interesting if someone writes an article on uh, claviceps, the um, grass you can go in your garden and shake <laughs> shake out the ergot and it's soluble in water and it's pure and you can dry it out, it'll stay around for a long time. You can't pass a law against grass, that kind. <laughs> right? What kind of grass do you have on your lawn? <laughs> right? The name is claviceps. You got the word. You got the name. Look it up. Right? Yes. Once something becomes so free and available, that, that is one way in which it might be gotten around. But apart from that, you know, our culture at this point may be very repressive of this, but um, there should be some country that's open to it. Some island, right? Some place, right? Bandini Mountains. Pardon? Bandini Mountains. Yes, Bandini Mountains. Yeah. What's Bandini Mountains? Suggesting. It must be an end joke or something. You're also suggesting that the way to, through words, and so far we haven't used any. Who's we? I mean, what? the discussion this evening is discussing this topic and speculating about it and just and, and I, yeah, you're quite right. in that I, sense that's using words to make the possibilities possibly more meaningful not, without even having taken it. 
and what are the oh. options. And in that sense, just talking about it and opening up those doors and making it available for uh, consideration and speculation and discussion no, I think that's may be a way to um, do it without the repression, at least at this point. Do it without the repression? <coughs> well, you're not going to be taking the drugs if you're talking about it. Oh, yeah, Let's that's right. Oh, the standard. speculative side, we're free. Yeah. Yeah, it's take, quite true. You can't take it in here. <laughs> All you can do is talk. That's right. We can talk about it. Yeah. We can build a word castle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yes, I was suggesting, though, the allegory of the cave, Plato's uh, allegory of the cave, divided line. Uh, I, was, I would also include the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Phaedo. See, the Platonic literature is rich in symbols and images and mythology. It might be readily transportable, as well as some other systems. That takes effort. Oh, yeah. Too many of these kids nowadays can't put two words together. All we need, is the, all we need is the one who can put three. <laughs> <laughs> but, say, I don't mean that facetiously in that sense. What I mean is that it doesn't have to be for everyone. All that has to become is an ideal. And if we can make the ideal as significant enough and challenging enough, there's going to be people who are going to be attracted to it. I mean, look what we did with this rat psychology in, in Anaheim. I mean, really, look what they did. I mean, look, it's astonishing what they did, you know? I mean, they, can you think of all, everything they put in there and how they move it, how they animate it, what they do? It's astonishing. Why not bring all of that talent? For our own, our higher purpose, instead of for the goddess fun. She's been maybe bankrupt for, for a kids. long time. Pardon me. Hypothesis, maybe it isn't for kids. But yeah. maybe what? Maybe this is not for kids. It has to be for, for people beyond 35, 45, 55. People that have had pain, experience, suffering in life. 45. Who are ready to, to go beyond certain things. Well, 45, I'll have to wait until I get there, of course. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. Me too. I wanted to uh, advance the discussion on, on logos and, and this words mm -hmm. issue, because that's something that, that I focus on a lot myself. I'm, I'm a graduate student. I study acting consistently. Mm -hmm. We're getting into this uh, idea of communication as being something much more than just entertainment and storytelling. One of the articles that we were reading, uh, reading had to do with the contention that perhaps glossolalia, the, the mm -hmm. uh, gibberish, yeah, 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 yeah. that might be the particular logos that uh, we might be evolving towards, if you will. And I'm sorry, I'm kind of being contentious here, but in response to what the gentleman that was saying, my understanding of, of entheogens and the, the experience that I personally have with them has had to do with an increased sense of communication. So it, it could perhaps be that our society without entheogens and without these particular dietary supplements, if you will, uh, <laughs> seem to uh, suppress communication inside us, and perhaps these entheogens might enhance them in, in the youth of our nation. I mean, they're going through a lot. I should say I'm going through a lot. I'm, I'm well, sure they would, but, 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 but you can't use them. <laughs> Well, the clinical studies have shown that a lot of the times when people are under the influence of certain chemicals, such as the, that effect of serotonin, their idea that they're communicating to another person doesn't mean they're actually communicating. They have a sense of communication. That was what, what would, the training would have to be, is to teach you when you're actually communicating to a person, mm -hmm. instead of just blithering. There is a great deal of difference between getting a point across to another person mm -hmm. and then or just pontificate to make yourself feel mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. There is a huge difference. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. And there's a training that would have to be made from the very end to teach you to actually think. That makes one more than that. Oh. If we had a hundred subjects going through one of these systems we're creating tonight, wouldn't it be interesting to find out among them who gained the most profound experiences and go through a careful analysis with them to discover uh, what kinds of things contributed. Say we only have 10 out of 100 to reach the highest level. Right. What if we can learn from them how to enhance the entire process and continually do that as an ongoing process so that you're feeding back into it the insights of the participants and of the people who are there as counselors? 
so that you have an ongoing, you know, you can bring in all kinds of people. You can bring in chemists, you can bring in all kinds of people with all kinds of talents. But How can they all come together to, into a unity? Pardon me? Profound is not necessarily divine. But, but you're getting close, though. Uh, having a trip where you're thinking you're on fire is profound. No, no, that's not. We have different ideas of profound. <laughs> <laughs> no. When you have some, uh, profound to me, it means when you're able to see something you hadn't seen before that has a vast consequence on your own thinking and opens up a new vista which is creative and challenging and has a certain kind of numinosity to it. That's what I'm familiar with, you know. I'm sure you are too from the way you talk. But That's profound. You have to train a person to recognize that. I mean, a person That's true. That's very, very important. I had a, I've known several people in the Zen game of which I played a role um, who've had very profound, uh, let's call them spiritual experiences, just to introduce another word, and they hadn't appreciated it themselves. They hadn't had an interview with the Roshi. They hadn't been in some way introduced to its value, and therefore they depreciated it. And it was only until later that they discovered by some, con some consequences, some talk with someone who did know, and perhaps another Roshi, of the fact that they did stumble into something they didn't appreciate. When they were opened up to it, they began to see its value. That's profound, you see, that's profound. That's the kind of thing that's significant. Yes, you have to have the logos, that kind of logos. That's, that's Within the structure is the freedom. Pardon me? Within the structure is the freedom. Oh, yeah. Structure is freedom. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah, especially if you have some very interesting axioms to start you off on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, when you have ritual, you have structure, right? Ritual is structure. Yeah. And myth is an articulation of it. That's right. Oh. So, I'm going to ask you later, to, next time you come sometime, to bring your, bring your brick, right? <laughs> Collect bricks for the new construction. It, it seems to me like this, this discussion inevitably ends up in political uh, pot, if you will, because the fact remains that it is the politics that maintain this uh, this cult, for lack of a better term, uh, under wraps. And I, I think that might be why I might have brought up the issue of the, uh, the cause of the suppression earlier, because it seems to me like unless we, unless we take on the political battle involved with just the principles behind this stuff and erase the myths in society about movies like Red Asphalt and, and, and you know, the, the terrible things that alcohol bringing along to our youth and combining them with drugs. If we can differentiate between the two things and make one more of a spiritual uh, enterprise, then, then perhaps we might have a better battle in, 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 in Congress. Which uh, it seems to me like it always ends up there. It always comes down to there. Because mushrooms nowadays are manslaughter if you, sure. if you're caught with the aid of this stuff. Of, of, of course, anything good is going to generate some kind of opposition and some kind of inner turmoil. So you have to build freedom within it, yeah, and integrity point, within it, yeah. I guess the point where if everyone in this room did it, were caught, it'd be on the news. If everyone we knew did it, it if, might be on the news. If everyone they knew did it, then Congress would start listening. It's the point where you, some people have to start doing it. And not be afraid of the consequence. If that is what it is mm. stopping, it's the fear of the consequence. There are people all over the underground uh, that are doing it, and they haven't come out of the closet yet. It's the fear of the consequence. Well, um, we didn't want to come out of the closet until it's ready. The time isn't ready yet. Uh, maybe uh, when Bill Moyers and other people like him uh, get going in a political scene like like Bill Moyers on PBS. Uh, Swimming around with treatment for drugs, uh, you know, etc. The whole idea of trying to treat drugs, uh, you know, like a disease, etc. And when the thinking starts to shift, maybe in another two, three, or four, or five, six years, then maybe at that time the the war on drugs uh, philosophy will start changing, and then maybe at that particular time it might be time for. It. Right now, politically, it just isn't right. Let me ask you a question, okay? Uh, since obviously a good number of you are familiar with these kinds of things. 
as a consequence of the experiences you've gone through, have you found later that you were attracted to a certain kind of literature, a certain kind of music, a certain way of being? If so, would you just volunteer some of the names? Uh, Carl Jung. Jung, okay. McKenna. McKenna. Scott? Oh, yeah, that's... Pursuing. Cool. Pursuing. Mozart. 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 Odigano, Gandhi, oh, oh. Tom Waits. <laughs> <laughs> Any better? Any better? <laughs> <laughs> oh, more, more, more. Kerouac. Kerouac. Jack Kerouac. Being and not doing. <laughs> I don't know that one. Michael Chuck. No, just in general. Oh, oh, I thought that was a book. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> being and not doing. Okay, that's a new one on me. Chekhov. Yeah. Chekhov, come on. Come on. Come on. Plato. Plato, come on. Geometry. See what you've got? Geometry. See what you've got? Jazz. What a nice group of people you are. The Greek gods. Don't worry about entering the profound. You're in, you're there. Look at the that Greek wonderful gods, stuff. Sir, the Greek gods archetypes. All right, surely. Dementor, Persephone, right? Yeah, that's right. Look, here's the, here's the curriculum. It'll grow. It'll all be good. It'll come out of your experience. Then we can share it, can't we? Hey, I'll tell you what I found important about it as a result of this and that trip, right? <laughs> hey, how many of your relationships, how many of you found that uh, your relationships have changed as a consequence of these particular past experiences, shall we call them? Have they? Yeah. Yes. Are you even looking for something more profound as a consequence of it? No, the relationship became more profound. Oh, and the relationship became what? Well, both ways is most beautiful. Right, how about that? How about appreciation for beauty? Mm -hmm. Definitely, right? Right? That's the mark, isn't it? <laughs> beauty is the doorway. Hey, as long as beauty's in the, as long as we have beauty, we're safe. <laughs> right, that's the doorway. That's the sign of integrity, right? Beauty's the doorway, right? Yeah. So look, we won't have any trouble doing it. Not only that, there'll be a great agreement of the kinds of stuff that we're gonna be doing. We don't have to worry about one another. Right? <laughs> so my only thought is, look, if the law here or there is upsetting, you know, and it won't allow it, hey, you know, uh, charter a plane and go where it's safe and uh, build it. Build it where it's safe. If they close it down, Forget about it. Let it stay there and become ruins for some other group of people. Build another one. <laughs> Don't worry about them closing it down. Don't worry about it. Let them close it down. More notoriety. Build it somewhere else. Build 10 of them. Until finally, you know what? I think, I'll tell you where I think this is going. I think it will finally go to the point where finally the... Uh, the Eleusinian mysteries will be reawakened. I think the Delphic Oracle will be reawakened. I think we'll go back to the old ways of being, which will be, to a large extent, Hellenic. I think that's where it's going. Because you know what? Everything you've said is classic. The spirit of that classic thought, which is not in Europe. This is not in Europe. We have to do it. We'll do it. We can do it. We'll do it. Now, there is a book I mentioned earlier, and I didn't mention the title of it, but I did say what I'm going to say come, has some, some relationship to a work, and I didn't mention the work. Huxley did a book, he died before he, he uh, completed it, but it was published uh, posthumously, called The Island. Now, I don't know whether you're familiar with it, but that's a book. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is what, exactly what he, where he was going. He was saying we have to have a society, we have to have a whole educational system that's devoted towards the culminating experience such as we've been describing. So he was going in that direction. And I think it's the right direction. In other words, you know, uh, we can make education meaningful. I, mean, I think one of the great curiosities is that 
we're trying to persuade one another that, that there's something wrong with our students. They're not doing as, they, as well as they should do. I think it's remarkable they're doing as well on such material as they have. I think it's remarkable they're doing so well. When I was going through it, I was bored to death. Well, most of it. But had they given me McKenna and uh, Carl Jung and Beethoven in class, maybe I would have woke up a bit. You know? <laughs> or maybe, maybe I had to wait for those other kinds of things to enter the world. Unfortunately, Carl Jung is dead. Uh, the Jungians uh, aren't the same thing. Well, that's always true, isn't it? I mean, you know, I mean... Yeah, he himself said, I'm glad I'm Carl Jung and not a Jungian. Yeah, of course, you know. Yeah. Yeah, vision is a property of those that are alive. Yeah. yeah. Of course, there are some writers who tend to have a vision that extended beyond their grave. Not too many. They're great. Homer. Who was his name? Plato. Plato? What's his first name? Uh, Plato, Plato. Oh, 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 I wanted to make a note of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> John Plato. Now, education would have it, and he was born when and where, and his mother's name was? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What is it that interests you in this story? Pardon? What is it that interests you in this it's obvious. <laughs> what is it that interests me apart from what I've been saying? No, Nothing. No, pardon me. I, I didn't mean that as a joke, even though this is very no, funny. I, I, I guess I'm trying to find out what is it that inspires you to take this seriously. Pardon? What is it that's inspired you to take this topic as seriously as you do? I've lived there. I've lived in this. This is. I've been there. I've been. I, I lived there. Yeah. Well, when you were living there, what did you see? Mm. <laughs> 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 I mean, did you see beauty? Was it beauty that you saw? Or, really? or yeah. did you yeah. comprehend it or whatever term you mm -hmm. Beauty? If it is a, it's, it's um, you know, it's easier to talk about one's sexual experience in public than it is to talk about beauty. Um, not that I'm inclined to do that. <laughs> but I mean, just from people I know of, they can just talk about it as freely as they talk about uh, having dinner. Uh, but I, yeah, I'll say something. I'll say something. Um, I have been caught, brought up, dwelt in a beauty which um, I knew that if I could endure it for one second more, it might cost me my life. And I was quite happy to pay the price if that was the price. Um, it wasn't until many years later See, I have gone through this door of drugs, but I first went through it without drugs. I entered it through drugs, and I've experienced the same thing through dreams. So it has been open for some reason to me, and therefore I can talk about it in that way. Um, I find it very sad that this kind of vehicle is available to people, and our system has closed that down. Um, if I knew of some way in which people could enter that without drugs, of course, I would urge them to do it. Um, therefore, I, there are times when I do urge people to get into Zen, go to Zen retreats, go to yoga retreats, go to spiritual retreats, Whatever seems to be significant to you, you know, participate in it. But um, uh, but some years after what I would call um, the unfoldment of beauty, 
I encountered s states of mind that were beyond that. That were beyond beauty. And I'll let that be. So my interest is uh, like sharing a friend or telling a friend about a friend. What's it like when you tell a friend about a book you love? Right? Like, right, right. You turn them on to a book. Right. But you Same have thing. The tools to utilize to make it the experience to work of art. If you don't have the tools to utilize it, if you don't have the oh. techniques, you're in trouble. Oh, I was so lucky. You see, I landed into philosophy quite early in life, and I never got out of it. So that's my background. I, I didn't get into philosophy as a result of these kinds of things. Uh, you know, so the first book I read was philosophy. Yeah, but you have an aptitude for it that there's lots of philosophy. No, no, I don't have no aptitude <laughs> for it. <laughs> I had the distinctive... <laughs> I'll, 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 my, my moment of fame came when I was 16 years old and they called me into the office of my high school and they said, we're very pleased that you reached 16, you. Out. So... <laughs> so I was, a, you know, one of those people who um, was told, we'll never get anywhere, never do anything, et cetera, et cetera. And I knew they were right. <laughs> then I hit philosophy, hit a book on philosophy. I said, oh my God, people talk like this, about the soul, about afterlife. Wow, this is astonishing. That ended it. Then I decided I might as well read. Yeah. yeah. So now I had... No, I, I was on the bottom of the list. I still am in some way, I think. Well, that's an attitude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't changed much. Uh, uh, Just got a couple more degrees, but I don't think I've changed anything. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, uh, uh, there is a saying uh, that you have to have a talent to do something like this, and I asked this person who the talent was. He said uh, you have to be highly conflicted, highly anxiety-ridden, highly guilt-ridden, a uh, highly obsessive compulsive with a strong ego, a strong sense of caring, and a strong sense of loyalty. Otherwise, when no. you encounter the experiences... No, no, I would add one. No, I would add one. Neurotic. No, no, no. No? Sense of humor. Well, that's sense of humor, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot that. That's included. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'd be at a loss without that. Yeah. Sense yeah. of humor uh, is also included. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad I reminded you. Yeah, good. Because if you don't have anxiety in your system, and, and you meet anxiety and fear on the other side, what do you do when you meet it? You run away, because it's too scary. Oh, yes, it certainly is. So people that don't have oh, enough yeah. pain and suffering are not going to be able to tolerate the, uh, the uh, because you aren't going to have just nice experiences all the time. Uh, heavenly, you also have the oh, dark side. No. And those are hard to handle. Unless you're familiar with guilt and anxiety and... Oh, oh yeah. yeah, oh yeah. That's where Carl Jung comes in. And that's why, <laughs> that's why, that's why you need someone to talk to when you're both going up and on your way down. <laughs> and hopefully, when you're on your way down, you can talk to someone that can help you turn it around. Oh yeah, counselors are vitally important. Right. I thank you very much for showing up this evening. I appreciate your attendance.